let's get into the Word today. Uh, we are continuing in our series here at Hewitt Community Church entitled Jesus the Messiah. It is through this series that we are studying the Gospel of Matthew. And today we are going to be finishing up, can you say praise the Lord, Matthew chapter 5. Uh, we've been in Matthew chapter 5 for a number of weeks. However, we are not done with the Sermon on the Mount. We still have two more chapters to go with the Sermon on the Mount. However, we're finishing up chapter 5. And, and chapter 5, uh, especially the last few weeks, Christ has been offering up uh, examples or standards of discipleship. Did you know that Christians are supposed to live differently from non-Christians? Christians are supposed to live differently from non-Christians. Christians are meant to stand out from non-Christians. But it's not necessarily in the way we dress or the way that we talk or the car that we drive or the house we live in. We, we are different from non-Christians in terms of the standards that we uphold in our daily living. Christ has been offering up examples of those standards. Today, we're going to look at the final one, which I think is probably the most challenging of all. And this is the standard on loving our enemy. That is a stipulation for discipleship. So let's go ahead and get into the scripture today. Uh, Matthew 5, 43 is where we're going to be beginning. And I'm going to break protocol here. Normally, I preach out of the NIV Bible today. Uh, we're going to preach out of the New King James. We're going to look at it in this version today. Some of you are so excited thinking, ooh, revival today. We're preaching out of the real Bible. All right. So, Matthew 5, 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, as before, Christ is referencing Old Testament scripture or Old Testament law. I think it was, uh, would be appropriate for us to look at the scripture that he is referencing. It is Leviticus 19, 18. Let's go ahead and look at this now. Which says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, I want you to notice there's a discrepancy there. There's a discrepancy between what Leviticus 19.18 says and how the Lord quoted it. Did you notice the discrepancy? There is nothing in there about hating your enemy. There is nothing whatsoever that is said in Leviticus 19.18 about hating your enemy. As a matter of fact, you will not find an Old Testament reference that encourages hating your enemy. As a matter of fact, it would be quite the opposite. Let me give you some examples. Uh, Exodus 23, 4. Look at this with me. If you come across your enemy's ox or donkey, donkey wandering off, be sure to return it. That doesn't sound like an act of hate to me, does it to you? And consider Proverbs 25, 21. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. So what is the point here? The point here is that Christ in Matthew 5, 43 is referencing this Old Testament law as it was being interpreted and as it was being taught to the people at that time. And I don't want to get off script here, but this is an inroad to say to you, this is precisely the reason why I'm always saying to you that you never just assume that everything that is being preached from the pulpit is true. You have been given the Word of God so that you may read it and study it for yourself. If for no other reason than to either confirm or to deny what is being preached from the pulpit is true. And let me say this. You have a responsibility to do so. Uh, Pastor Zach was talking about jobs today and the job that is ours. Well, I would agree with him. You and I, we have a job. We have a job this morning to sit under the teaching of the Scripture, but then your job goes beyond that where now you have a responsibility to read and to study the Scriptures for yourself to confirm that what is being said is true. As you can see by this example, what the preacher says and what the Word says are not always the same thing. Okay, 
So I get off that soapbox and uh, that, that first sermon. Uh, let's, let's move on. Let's look at Christ's interpretation of this law as we continue reading Matthew 5, 44. He says, but I say to you, love your enemies. Okay, let's just stop right there. Uh, let's begin uh, by uh, breaking this down as to defining who an enemy is. Exactly who is an enemy? Well, to the Hebrews, uh, and this is a bit of an oversimplification, but to the Hebrews, uh, their neighbor was another Hebrew. So for the Hebrew culture, uh, Hebrews were neighbors, non-Hebrews were enemies. Anybody that wasn't a Hebrew, any Gentile was considered an enemy. Well, if you springboard off of that, then what the Lord is saying is that to love your enemy really means to love all people. And I think that that falls in line with what he's going to say later on in Matthew 22 about loving the Lord your God and loving your neighbor, uh, about loving God and loving people. These are the two biggest commandments for Christians to follow. If you can't follow anything else, if you can't remember anything else, if you're going to be a disciple of Christ, you're going to embrace those two things. Uh, that, of course, is the reason for the motto that we have here at Hewitt Community Church, loving God and love people. Hey, if you can get those two things down, Jesus himself said, if you can get those two things, you have embraced the totality of the Scriptures itself. Okay, but on a more specific level, on a more specific scale, who is our enemy? Well, Christ has already identified the enemy. He's already uh, defined the enemy for us in the previous verses that we've already read. Go back to Matthew 5, 39, where he defines an enemy as anyone who slaps you on the right cheek. I would say that that pretty much covers being an enemy. Look at it. goes on to say in verse 40, anyone who wants to sue you. And to take your, take your tunic. Yeah, I would say that that's an enemy. Go on. Whoever compels you to go a mile. Whoever wants to borrow from you. That's an enemy. Okay, so through these descriptions, Christ is narrowing down the definition of an enemy in that it can be defined as someone who has unfairly taken advantage of you or someone who has mistreated you in some way. Now, I, I took this little poll last Sunday. Let me take it again. Is there anybody here and you've ever been treated unfairly? Ever been treated unjustly? Okay. Well, then we're talking about something, a subject that today that is relevant to every single one of us. Now, you will recall that last Sunday when we looked at this subject matter, the Lord addressed dealing with enemies within a judicial context. Do you remember that? He, he fundamentally said, if you are treated unfairly, if you are treated unjustly, and it is within your power to reasonably attain justice for yourself, then you should take those measures. But if you are unable to get justice for yourself through reasonable means then just leave it in the hands of the Lord. The primary emphasis, the primary teaching here being this. You either trust God in all situations of your life or you don't. That is a stipulation for discipleship. If you're going to be a disciple of Christ, you must trust Him with every facet, with every detail of your life, no matter how small, no matter how large, including those times that you've been treated unfairly and you can't get justice for yourself. And so the Lord here uh, last Sunday was dealing with uh, how, how to deal with a, a, an enemy within a judicial context. Well, here he's still talking about dealing with an enemy, only this time he's talking about how to deal with an enemy within a personal context. Or you might say it like this, as his disciple, you are commanded to walk away from the offense, but at the exact same time, you are commanded to walk toward the offender. That, that's what loving your enemy means. And Christ goes on to describe how we manifest love for an enemy in three different ways. Number one, he says you love your enemy through your words. 
That's in Matthew 5, 44, continuing there. He says, bless those who curse you. Now, this is not difficult. Uh, the word curse there uh, conveys gossip or slander. We're talking about somebody who's, uh, they're, they're criticizing you. They're talking negatively about you. They're defaming your character. Uh, the nature of today's world, today's society is to return that kind of negative talk with our own negative talk, to return gossip with more gossip, to return slander with, with more slander. You talk about me, I'm going to talk about you. But in this context, the word bless conveys a good word. It conveys finding something good to say about your enemy. Isn't that interesting? And, and so the distinctiveness of discipleship then is that we meet the negativity and the malice of an enemy with positivity and kindness. It's the way that you love your enemy through your words and through your language. Well, then the Lord touch, touches on a second way that we are to love our enemy. And I think you can understand why this would be the, the natural uh, next step is to love through your deeds. Uh, that's continuing in Matthew 5, 44. He says, do good to those who hate you. Now, again, this is not difficult to understand. Uh, whereas blessing those who curse you is primarily about your words. Doing good to those who hate you is primarily about your actions. I said it last Sunday. I'll say it again. If you identify as a Christian and you are awake, and I am talking to people who are awake this morning, I was hoping so, uh, then you're on the clock. And if you are on the clock, then you are responsible to be the embodiment of Christ. And you don't get a free pass on that responsibility just because you're having a bad day or because somebody is treating you badly. And so you are to love your enemies through your speech. You are to love your enemies through your actions. And then finally, look at this third and final way that we are to love our enemies, and that is through your prayers. Through your prayers. And this is the most significant of all. Uh, Matthew 5, again. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Now, let me tell you why this is so important. And let me tell you why this detail is, is so relevant. Because whereas words and deeds convey your public responsibilities toward an enemy, your prayer life conveys your private responsibilities toward an enemy. And as you know, they're not always the same. Have you ever read the Psalms? The Psalms are fascinating because the Psalms uh, contain a lot of prayers that David prayed. And I'm thinking of it as, as prayers that he prayed in private. And if you read those Psalms, you'll notice that he makes reference to his enemies quite a lot. And, and some of the stuff that he asked God to do to his enemies, it is not very nice. Now, what's that all about? Well, here's what I think it's about. I think it's about the fact that David struggled with being one person in public while being another person in private. See, as, as the king of Israel, he had a public reputation to uphold and, and to protect. And so publicly, he watched his P's and Q's. Publicly, he behaved as he was expected to behave, including how he treated his enemy. But privately, oh, privately, he'd throw off that crown. He'd take off that royal robe. He'd go into his prayer closet and he'd say, God, I can't stand that guy. And here's what I'd like for you to do. You know what would be awesome, God? Just break his teeth while they're still in his mouth. That would be fantastic. <laughs> Read it for yourself. That is the kind of stuff that David prayed. What is the point? The point is his public persona toward his enemy and his private, private persona toward his enemy didn't always line up. And on a larger, grander scale, that's what we're talking about today. We're, we're talking about the fact that, okay, loving your enemies is important. Yes, I get that. As a Christian, I understand I'm supposed to, to love my enemies, and I don't want to take focus off that. But what Christ is saying here is this. 
understand this this morning, Hewitt Community Church. He's saying, if you're going to be my disciple, then who you are privately has got to be the same person that you are publicly. You can't be one person in public and another person in private and expect to be my disciple. No disciple of mine is going to love their enemy on the public front, but not love their enemy, but disdain their enemy on the private front. Private front. And he goes on to explain why as we continue reading in, in the scriptures. Number one, he says, because you are sons and daughters of God. Let's go back to the scripture, Matthew 5, 45. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Now, I want you to notice a detail here. Notice here that Christ identifies the son as his son or as the father's son. Now, we've talked about this before. Um, Ownership equals sovereignty, right? When you own something, you are sovereign over it. When you own something, you can do with it whatever you want. You're not obligated to do anything. Whatever you do is because you choose to do it. I was congratulating um, 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 Deborah. What is your son's name? Jerome. Jerome, I'm so sorry. I just had a senior moment just there, Martin. Jerome and Auburn. Jerome and Auburn, uh, they just, they bought a new house. They just got a new house. Can we congratulate them on their new house? And now Jerome and Auburn, they can paint those walls purple if they want to. They can paint them orange. They can paint flames. They can do whatever they want. They are sovereign over their house. Well, that's what the Lord is saying here. He's saying the son is my son. I'm sovereign over the son. God can do whatever he wants to do with the son, and he doesn't have to answer to anybody. But do you know what he chooses to do? Did you notice? He chooses to allow his son to rise on both the good and the evil. He chooses to allow the rain, his rain, to fall on both the good and the evil. What is the point here? The point here is the Lord's actions are a reflection of his heart. Or you might say it's like this. The rising of the sun and the falling of the rain proves that God loves all men privately in the same way that he loves them publicly. And so in this context, the word son means imitator. That's the role of a son. I've shared it this way before. My name is Ken Riley Jr. I am the son to Ken Riley Sr. And happy Father's Day to you, Dad. Uh, not only do I bear my dad's name, I am told that I bear my dad's image. All my life I have been told, you look just like your dad. And so what I assume, what I have learned that that means is that because I'm named after I'm da- my dad and because I look like my dad, then I must act like my dad. And there are times when Teresa says... Oh, wow. Let's get this over with. There are times when Teresa says, you act just like your dad. (laughs) Where was I? I don't even know what I was talking about now. The point being is that if you are a son or a daughter of God, and you are a son of daughter through Christ, then you have a responsibility to act like Christ because in the spirit realm, you have his name and you look like him. You remember I've talked about that before? In the spirit realm, when you go before the throne of God, it is as if you have never sinned. That's what I mean by looking like Christ. You're sinless. 
And because you bear the name and because you have the image, then you also have the responsibility of acting like your father. 1 John 3.18, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. I'm going to come back to that. Let's go on to the second reason that God expects us to love our enemies both publicly and privately, and it's because it yields great rewards. Matthew 5, 46, For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? All right, so um, in my opinion, um, an understanding of this statement necessitates an understanding of the word reward. Uh, For me, um, I don't know, I, I struggle with this a little bit. I find it a little shallow that the motivation for loving my enemy is because there's a reward for doing so. You know, it's kind of like, if you're good, I'll give you a candy bar. You know, that, that kind of thing. And I don't know that that's necessarily, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know that I, I like that very much. Maybe, maybe you have another point. But I, I, I did find this. I found that the word reward, uh, you could, in place of reward, you could use the word wages or even the word paycheck. And and so that takes Matthew 5, 46, and it says, if you love those who love you, what paycheck have you? For me, that that changes it a a little bit because it puts discipleship a little bit more into a a, um, workplace scenario. Uh, And I think you could say it like this. As disciples of Christ, would you agree that you have been paid well I was hoping for a little bit more of a response than that. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree, as disciples of Christ, you've been paid well? And would you agree that you've been paid in advance? I mean, when you think about what the blood of Christ paid in terms of our past and our present and our future, in terms of the destiny, the identity, I think we can agree that we've been paid well. And so when I look at Matthew 5, 46, and this is something for you to consider, I think of it like this. You've not been paid well, and you've not been paid in advance so you could turn around and hate your enemies. You've already been paid to do your job, and you've been paid well to do that job. And so now, love your enemies because you're paid to do so. And now I take you back uh, to 1 John 3, 18. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. I talked about this last Sunday. That, those words, action and truth, those are workplace words. In, in this context, they're workplace words. And, and what they mean that if you are a Christian, and again, I said it before, I'll say it again. If you're awake and you're a Christian, you're on the clock. A- as a Christian, you are the official representative. You are the official voice and the face of the kingdom of heaven. You are the face and you are the voice of Christ. And loving an enemy means getting down to business, uh, to representing Christ, to representing the kingdom of heaven, to doing it well, to representing it with excellence, because regardless of the circumstances, you have already been paid to do so. That brings me to the third reason that God expects us to love our enemies both publicly and privately. It's because it is distinctive to your Christian witness. Matthew 5, 46 and 47, he says, Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what uh, do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Uh, Christ has already addressed this principle once before in Matthew 5.14. He says, you are the light of the world. 
uh, you are expected to light your light shine once again. Uh, the standard is the same as before. If you are a Christian, uh, you are expected to live differently uh, than a non-Christian. Uh, once again, again, as a Christian, uh, you have standards to live by. Uh, here again, Christ clarifies that our distinctiveness is not revealed through the clothes we wear or the songs we sing and the prayers we pray. Our, our distinctiveness is revealed through our un restricted love when we restrict ourselves to only loving those who love us back we lose our holiness we make ourselves common uh, we make ourselves no different from anybody else and God's people were never meant to be common God's people were never meant to go with the flow God's people were never meant to get lost in the crowd God's people were meant to stand out in the crowd and so it is with this in mind that Matthew 5 closes with this statement in verse 48. He says, therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now what Christ is doing here, he is summing up the five examples of the five standards of discipleship that he's already given us. So let's take just a moment to review those. We've talked about those over the last couple of Sundays one, as a disciple of Christ, you have a responsibility to respect the value and the sanctity of life. You remember that? Number two, as a disciple of Christ, you are responsible to have a proper respect for the value and the sanctity of married life and the sexual purity which accompanies it. Number three, Christians are people who value truth. Christians are people who keep their promises. Number four, Christians are people who embrace mercy and love justice and leave justice in God's hands. And then finally, number five, Christians are people who have an unrestricted love, not only respect to whom they love, but how they love, both publicly and privately. What do these five standards have to do with Matthew 5.48? These five examples are just a mere cross-section of the life of discipleship. And yet, I don't know if you've thought about it like this, but if these were the only five, if these were the, the only five things that we were required to do, if these were the only five things that we were responsible for keeping, wouldn't you agree that we would still need the help and the advocate of a Savior? What Christ is pointing to this morning is that if even if sin were not the problem, even if sin weren't the problem, now it's a problem, but even if it weren't, we would still need an advocate. Even if sin were not the problem, we would still need a Savior. We would still need somebody that was stronger than us and wiser than us and more experienced with us. We would still need an advocate who could come alongside us to help us bear the burden of these responsibilities so that we could meet the goals of discipleship. Even if sin were not a problem, we would still need a Savior, and we do need a Savior every single day day. We need the love of somebody who's going to love us when we act like his friends. And let's be honest, we also need the love of somebody that's going to love us when we act like his enemies. And you know what I mean. There are times when I be, our behavior, when our speech, sometimes it's privately and sometimes it's publicly. But there are times when we act and we speak as though we were enemies of Christ, not friends and not disciples. And yet the love of Christ is so consistent that even without sin in the picture, he is still willing to come alongside us and to help us with these roles of discipleship. Hebrews 7.25 Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God. That word uttermost means fully, completely, perfectly, 
What that means for you and I today is that Christ is the answer to every question. Christ is the solution to every problem. Christ is the clearance to every obstacle. And Christ is the achievement to every goal. But I would also remind you of this, 1 Corinthians 16, 14. He says this, let all that you do be done in love. Let all that you do be done in love. As Joy mentioned, next month we're designating a Sunday for Membership Sunday. And what I'm about to share with you, those of you that are home folk, you, you know about, you know this. Uh, I've, I've shared this before because I always share it on Membership Sunday, and I plan on doing so on that day. But as I was contemplating this message and how to bring this message to a close, I, I just felt that this was so appropriate. Um, a community of performance versus a community of grace. I, I want you to listen to this. In a community of performance, the leaders all appear to have everything figured out. In a community of performance, the community appears respectable. And the meetings are a polished performance. Failure is devastating because our identity is found in that performance. In a community of performance, actions are driven by duty. And conflict is suppressed. And the focus is on orthodox behavior. We want to let everybody think that we've got life all figured out. That, that's a community of performance. But now look at a community of grace. In a community of grace, the leaders are vulnerable. And the community is messy. Jerome, I'm sorry I forgot your name. Our community is messy. In a community of grace, the meetings are just one part of our community life. And so failure, why it's disappointing, it's not devastating. Because our identity is not found in our performance, our identity is found in Christ. In a community of grace, our actions are driven by joy. And conflict is openly addressed. And the focus is on the affections of the heart. In a performance-oriented community, the people all appear to be okay because their standing with the, in the church depends upon it. But in a grace-oriented church, the people all acknowledge that they're sinners, that they're messed up, that they're struggling, and that they depend upon Christ daily to make life work. When a grace-oriented church comes together, they accept one another and they celebrate God's grace toward each other. They rejoice that we are all children of God through the work of Christ. And we remind each other of these truths because we all need them in order to keep on going and to keep on changing. I won't stand here and say that I'm a perfect pastor, and I certainly won't stand here and say that you are a perfect church. But I would say that a point of pride for me is that I would identify Hewitt Community Church as a grace-filled church and as a grace-filled community. And while I am proud of that identity, let us not forget that it is all because of the work of a magnificent perfect son who obediently went to the cross at the command of his father. Romans 10, 9 says that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you declare if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Two stipulations that are offered up here for salvation Number one, you must declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Here at Hewitt Community Church, hopefully you know what that means. To declare with your mouth is to agree. We agree with what the Bible says. We agree with what the Bible says about who God is. And we agree with what the Bible says about 
who Jesus is. Oh, but we also agree with what the Bible says about who we are. And the Bible says some unpleasant things about who we are. But the Bible does not say those things about us to make us feel bad about ourselves. Doesn't say those things to insult us or to hurt our feelings. The Bible says these things so that we would know how desperately we need a Savior and how we need a Savior every single day. And salvation entails a regular regimen of agreement. Lord, today I need a Savior. And Lord, today I acknowledge that there is no other Savior except you. That's what salvation is. But then it goes on to say that we must also believe in our hearts that God raised Christ from the dead. What is that all about? Well, it's about the fact that even the five things that we've talked about over the last several Sundays concerning the standards of disciples, they're good, they're good standards. And I would agree that they're standards that Christians should live by. But it is impossible for us to live by those standards just through willpower. It's impossible for us to keep those standards of discipleship by ourselves. We need help. We need a Savior. We need an advocate. And the Bible says that that has been provided for you. Because not only when you call upon the name of the Lord does Jesus come into your life, but the Holy Spirit comes into your life. That's what the Bible says. And the Bible describes the Holy Spirit as a power that was able to raise a dead body back to life after three days in the grave. That's pretty powerful. And it says, now it lives inside of you. And God in His love and His provision and His care has given you that power, not because you deserved it, but so that He could come alongside you and help you to achieve the goals of discipleship that He has set for you. That's the reason why I'm such a big advocate of Ephesians 3.20. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more, anything that you could ask or you could think or you could even imagine, that is the promise that he makes to you. And salvation entails a regular regimen of not only declaring and agreeing that Jesus Christ is Savior, but in clinging to the fact that His Holy Spirit lives inside of me and He lives inside of you and these standards of discipleship, even the one that says you must love your enemy privately as well as publicly can be accomplished when you cling to Him. I just want to close with a word of prayer today. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. This is a practical message. And oftentimes, we look at practical messages just through a practical lens. You give us a command, and we do it. But this command is is so different because it strikes at at our very hearts, our, our very nature, the inmost parts of us. That part of us that we might be able to hide from other people, but we can't hide from you. And so now you've You've imposed upon us a standard. But Lord, if I'm, if I'm going to be completely honest, I, I, can't, I can't meet this standard by myself. And that's where I have the joy of knowing that the Holy Spirit is on my side. And He is working in me, even now. And Lord, it is because the Holy Spirit is alive and well in me and in these believers among me today. that We may not be a community of performance, but we are a community of grace. 
And we know where our grace comes from. It comes from you. So first of all, we would say thank you for the Savior that we have in Jesus Christ. And we want to thank you for the power that is ours through your Holy Spirit. But as this pastor, let me bring this service to a close by just simply asking that you would help us to embrace a regular regimen of confessing you as our Savior, declaring you as our Savior, agreeing that you are the only hope that we have for a Savior, and depending upon the power of the Holy Spirit to help us to even do the impossible, to love our enemies. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, and everyone said amen.